Okay, Pat, ready to go? Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome um, to, um, to another Women's Foreign Policy event. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us for this is for um, our Beyond the Headlines event. Uh, it's combating the spread of Ebola, the US, and, the U.S. aid effort in Liberia. I'm happy to welcome my colleague, Helene Cooper, the Pentagon correspondent for the New York Times, who has recently been liberated from a 21-day quarantine at home. Um, after returning from, uh, liberated actually today, was her first day back in the office. Um, she, after returning from a two-week assignment when she was embedded with the U.S. military uh, in Liberia. Uh, we're extremely pleased to be partnering once again with NYU Washington, D.C., and to be meeting in this very beautiful space. My name is Elizabeth Buemiller. I'm Deputy Washington Bureau Chief of the Times. I'm also a board member of the Women's Foreign Policy Group, and I'm your moderator for this evening. Um, on behalf of the other board members with us tonight, Gail Kitch, Teresa Lohr, and our president, Pat Ellis, we welcome you and thank you for joining us. As you know, this is the, um, you listen carefully, the Women's Foreign Policy Group promotes women's leadership and voices on major international issues of the day. This turnout is a tribute to our speaker and for the interest in this, in this topic. Uh, we're especially pleased to see so many of our diplomats here with us tonight, and we'd like to extend a warm welcome to the ambassadors here. Um, I would also like to recognize our corporate advisory council members from CH2M Hill and McClarty Associates. Um, before I say a few more words about Helene, I'd like to mention our next event, which will be held this Friday and will focus on Turkey. Uh, we're also having an embassy series event at the residence of the Ambassador of Japan on November 20th, so please uh, put those on your calendar. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Helene, my friend, who has also covered the White House and the State Department for the Times. She's the author of a New York Times bestseller, The House at Sugar Beach in Search of a Lost African Childhood. Uh, if you haven't read it, you, sh you should. It's an unbelievably riveting, compelling book about Helene's childhood growing up in Liberia. Um, it, uh, it's a page turner, beautifully written. Um, and she's also now at work on another book, a biography of the country's president, Helen Johnson Sirleaf. Um, Helene's a great character at the office. She's a huge amount of fun. We're very glad to have her back. I should say I also covered the Pentagon. It was my last job before I went into the dark hole of management and editing. <laughs> and so um, I really enjoy uh, working with Helene. After Helene speaks, we'll go to Q&A. She's going to talk for, what, 15 minutes? And then I'll ask a few questions, um, but then I'm going to open up the uh, floor to questions from you. So please welcome Helene. See, now you have to touch me. <laughs> so, are you guys okay if I do this from here? Yeah, sure. um, okay. okay. Uh, thanks so much for having me, uh, the Women's Foreign Policy uh, Group, and also to NYU for letting us use this great space. It's really cool to get uh, introduced by my boss. <laughs> who, and Bue Miller is, sorry, I call her Bue Miller. It's all right. <laughs> like, Newspaper. Uh, but Bue Miller, Miller was my friend before she was my boss, and she's you know one of the best editors that we have at the New York Times. Uh, I was trying to think of you know some what I was going to talk about tonight, and you know came up with some you know sort of not sort of bland topics that I would just touch on and you know then move on, and then I I realized that what I really wanted to talk about was sort of the difference that I found in the perception and the views of Ebola uh, here in the United States and then in the rest of the world, but particularly in Liberia, which is uh, where I spent um, two weeks. And I thought I could do that just by just walking through my two-week trip there. Uh, as Bue Miller mentioned, I'm from Liberia. That's where I grew up. I uh, became an American citizen in 1997. So. You know, I'm now American. I cover the military for the New York Times. I had been working on uh, a book, and I took last year off on uh, a book leave to do a book about Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. And I'm ashamed to say that the first thing I, when I first started hearing about back in June that Ebola had, and I'd missed the whole March. It, Ebola sort of arrived in Liberia in March. There was a brief flare up. It made it to the Firestone. Uh, which is just outside of Monrovia, and then it died down. 
And I didn't, that sort of, I missed all of that. And then in June, it made a return. And the first thing I thought was, you know, oh my God, what is this going to do to my book? Which is like a very selfish, as you can imagine, reaction. <laughs> but then it started getting worse. And in July, Patrick Sawyer, everybody in Liberia now talks about Patrick Sawyer. He has some, he's very, very famous there now. He's the guy who got on the plane to Nigeria and threw up after he landed. And that just set off this entire scare. <coughs> and at that point, things started to get really, really bad and the world's attention turned to it, although at the time it seems like it, everybody was still much more into the ALS ice bucket challenge than this pandemic that was brewing in West Africa. Um, and I started thinking and my first thought was at some point I'm going to have to deal with this for my book and I'm going to have to think about going back uh, and seeing how to adjust because uh, the, the manuscript was wit written and to adjust uh, for how Ellen Johnson Sirleaf is dealing with this issue. And I thought I had one more week of vacation left and I would take that and go back to Liberia. Uh, and then President Obama announced that he was sending in the American military, which is my beat. And so I immediately went to Bubiller and I was like, I think I should go to Liberia with them. And I was really prepared to like, make this argument to her and she didn't bat an eyelash. And she's like, yeah, of course. And it was like, it was a little bit surprising how quick the times was to, you know, immediately say, yes, we want you to go. And that was great. Uh, and as soon as that happened, my focus shifted immediately from my book to journalism. And then it became, you know, what am I going to do there? What stories do I want to tell? How am I going to do this? Uh, and so anyway, in September, I went to Liberia with the, I went on a, it was weird, it was a Gulf Stream. It's the nicest plane I've ever been on. It was a Gulf Stream and we flew from Andrews straight to Monrovia. Okay, as somebody <laughs> who flies to Liberia all the time, I've been through every conceivable way to get there, Ghana, you know, Nigeria. I, you always have to stop and change planes a couple of times. Lately, you know, you could go on Brussels. But the idea of being able to fly from Washington to Roberts Field was, was fantastic. But we got there, I went with the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations, Michael Lumpkin, and a small American delegation. And we got to Robertsville late that night. And I went into it very, very nervous and scared. I was nervous about what Liberia, what Ebola was doing to my country. I was worried about my family that was there. I had two sisters who were there. I have a niece. I have a lot of extended family. And one sister is a healthcare worker. And so I was very nervous about them. I was nervous about myself because for the first time, I mean, I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan, but in the lead up to going to Liberia, I can't tell you how many emails and phone calls I got from people going, saying, I can't believe you're going to Liberia, be careful. I kept getting these emails that just kept ramping up my pressure and the level of, you know, how tense I was saying, you know, as if you're really going into the belly of the beast. Um, and so when I arrived, I remember checking into my hotel, we're staying at the Mama Point Hotel, and I wiped down that room with like Clorox <laughs> first night. Because you get to the Mama Point Hotel and uh, they take your temperature outside, you wash your hands with bleach. Even at Robertsfield, we arrived at Robertsfield and airport and they took our temperature, we got in the car, they took us to the hotel, we, you have to step in um, this bleach solution to clean your feet, you wash your hands, you go in. I wouldn't let the bellhop take my luggage because I didn't want him touching it. I was completely, you know, very, very, I had been here and I was like, I'm, I had it in my mind, even though I, under, I, I had heard the science that you get it from bodily fluids, it's not airborne. I, somewhere it hadn't clicked in my head. And so I went into this very, very nervous, I had planned, I mean, I. I made Andrew Siddons, who's the news assistant in our office, order, he ordered me 700 um, things of chlorine wipes that I carried around. My bag was packed with chlorine wipes and I had the giant things and then I had three bottles of bleach spray bleach. And so I'm running around my room spraying everything and wiping the whole thing down. And I had planned to, even when I go to restaurants, I was gonna wipe the utensils, wipe the plate, all sorts of stuff. And that lasted about a day. Um, and then I saw my sister, Janice, who, works for the Carter Center and she's now on loan from the Carter Center to um, uh, the Liberian Department of Public Health uh, for the duration 
of the Ebola crisis. And we had a long talk because she had, you know, we had all been haranguing her, leave Liberia, leave Liberia, and she wouldn't, she left, but then she went back. And I talked to her for a long time, and she was the first sort of reality check for me on just how this disease spreads. And I kept saying, but you know, what about this and what about that? And what she said to me, which really helped for my reporting there, was somebody, you're only going to get Ebola if you come into contact with somebody who, with, if you actually touch somebody who's actively sick. And somebody who you're not actively, you're not contagious until you're actively sick. So think about it this way. Somebody who is actively sick and contagious is not going to be cleaning your hotel room. They're not going to be cooking your food. They're not going to be walking around broad, down Broad Street, you know, waiting to touch you. They're going to be vomiting and sick in their house. And that's sort of one of those things that I don't think we here in the United States understand yet. And, but it was a really good reality check for me. And that conversation for me helped me just put aside all this ridiculous panic that I had in my own head. And finally, I was able to do the job that I was sent there to do, which is look at how Liberia, this third world country that is poor, is recovering from a civil war, is just barely getting back on its feet again and has been dealt this enormous you know, epidemic to sort of get around. And you see Liberians on the street and they're going about their business even though so many foreigners have fled and so many, the economy is grinding to a uh, standstill and they're still you know, trying to get, get, get on with things. And that was just sort of, that, that was a big eye opener for me but it also just struck me and the whole issue of the resilience of Liberians. I mean Liberians, have been through hell. Every Liberian you see on the street pretty much is a survivor. They've lived through a civil war. The women have been through the kind of horrors you can't even begin to imagine. You have former combatants, you have former child soldiers, you have all these people who are dealing with enormous, tremendous psychological scarring. And then you take that and on top of all of that, just as they're starting to come out of that, you put this awful pandemic. <coughs> and so there's a, there ends up, I think, breeding a, a resilience, I think, that <coughs> struck me at first. I just kept thinking, these people are so much stronger. I felt like I'm soft. I've become very American. I can't deal with any level of risk. And there's these Liberian people are out there, and they're still, what I found really incredible was they're still helping each other. You know, they're still lifting up, you know, their friends and family members as they get sick. And that was one of the things <coughs> that really struck me. Um, Two days, two or three days after I arrived, I arrived, Thomas Eric Duncan happened, which is he, uh, the news came out that this Liberian had come to Dallas and had tested positive uh, for Ebola, was in the hospital. And it was amazing to me that all I looked, I would look at Facebook at night and you see all this, the sort of the level of, of chatter on CNN and on Fox and on you know, the news stations, even in the newspapers and on Facebook from people, you know, my friends back at home was all, uh, so much of it seemed to ask the question was why would anybody be stupid enough to touch somebody who has Ebola? And it just didn't seem to get what I thought was sort of one of the fundamental issues. And I almost didn't understand it because everybody in Liberia at this point knows don't touch anybody. You won't get Ebola if you just stick to this, don't touch anybody. And so I didn't, I, I started asking the question why would these people knowing this touch people. And so I set out to do the story, a story that answered that question of why are they still touching each other? Why are they still touching? And it, it, the answer was so simple, but it's one that I hadn't thought about, which is that you're, you know, the people who are touching by and large are either healthcare workers or their family members. And it's like really easy for us to sit down and say, oh, I'm not gonna touch somebody. But if this year I met this woman, uh, patients, and she got it from her two-year-old daughter who caught it from the nanny. And her two-year-old daughter, daughter is vomiting and crying and has diarrhea. And of course, she's, her mom is going to pick her up. And I spent some time at this Ebola treatment unit talking to survivors. And because they were the people, Ebola survivors were the people who I thought could answer the question because I could ask them, why did you touch somebody with Ebola? Even if you didn't know they had Ebola, why would you, given what's going on right now, why would you touch them? And the answer I got with every single person I talked to was, it was my mom, it was my sister, it was, my, it was a very close family member. And when I started going through that, yeah, I hope I would put gloves on, but I start going through that 
in my mind, I think about my mom, I think about my nephew who's four, and I think about my closest family members, I hope I would put on gloves, but I don't know that I necessarily, because at that point your emotions are so engaged and that's what was happening there. And that really, for me, it just sort of, it was a different way, I hope, to cover the story, but it helped me also, I think, to look at, you know, to look at Liberians a little bit different and to ask different questions. I spent a lot of time with the US military and I spent some time with the Liberian military. And the Liberian military part was interesting as well because I have an innate, like because of the history of what my family has been through, we're sort of, you know, we went through a lot during the military coup in Liberia. We have a bad history with Liberian soldiers and the idea of, I still to this day, because of what happened to my family when I was 14 during the coup, I see a Liberian soldier in uniform and I freak out. And all of a sudden, these guys who, you know, I look at, it's a new military now, and you know, all the guys who were involved in the Civil War have moved on and they're different, but they're now out there trying to build treatment units, uh, Ebola treatment units. And so I spent a lot of time with them and it was a way, I hope, for me to sort of get at whether the Liberian military is changing, if they can overcome their own history. And it was, I, for me, it was an interesting story uh, to be able to try to cover. I spent a lot of time with the American military guys who were building treatment units. And, you know, it's very much just what you would expect, a very hurry up and wait. There are construction delays. There's this, there's that. It's not going up as fast as anybody wants. And at a time, you're racing to catch up with this pandemic and feeling very helpless. And that, I thought, was really, you know, an interesting thing. And I remember on while I was working on this this story going around to these different Ebola treatment units with these American military guys and they were surveying them so they could figure out what exactly they needed to know to build a proper Ebola hospital and it's not the same thing as building an army field hospital where you just put up a tent you know for Ebola is very different most Ebola patients for instance a lot of them a huge not most of them but a huge number of people with Ebola in Ebola treatment units who are gonna die, die in the bathroom. And so, because there's so much vomiting and so much diarrhea. So you have to build bathrooms so they're, they're big enough that you can maneuver around and maneuver a body out. And it's all these little things that you wouldn't expect. You have to quarantine people. You have to you know, set aside the suspects cases from the this. You need to have some sort of viewing area for family members who come to see see people so that they can't touch them. You got there's just also there's chlorine showers for the people in the hazmat suits who are going in and out and it's really, really complicated. And it's even complicated on the people you you admit. And I remember standing with Michael Lumpkin, who is the Assistant Secretary for Defense or Special Operations. This was our third day in Liberia. And we went to Elwa three, which is an Ebola treatment unit that's run by MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, and we were in the triage area. Uh, and they kept us behind, so we're separated from patients coming in by sort of the distance from me to the front row of the seats here. And Lumpkin is one of those Pentagon officials who I really don't like interviewing because he doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> he's like, so, you know, he is, a, he's, he know, you know he knows all this stuff, but he is really good at like just batting it aside. So I'm staying there with Lumpkin and this ambulance comes in. And the triage workers, I'm standing back here, the triage workers are like right here, and the ambulance is back in the where the audience is. And it comes in, and first the ambulance driver gets out, and the triage workers start screaming at the ambulance driver, and they're like, step aside, step aside, do this, do this, and then they're like, okay, um, before you take off your gloves, go and open the door of the back door of the ambulance. Open it, okay, move yourself immediately. And then they yell at him and they're like, okay, go wash those gloves with chlorine. And he's washing with chlorine. They're like, okay, take off those gloves, but you better have another pair of gloves underneath that. And he's like, yes, I do. And they're like, okay, wash that. Okay, take that stuff. Now you go stand. And they're focusing on him and it's all about how to make sure he's kept safe because there's a partition between him and his patients when the patients get out. And so they're like, go and stand over there. And he goes and he stands very far away from the ambulance. And then they yell at the ambulance that the door is now slightly ajar. They're like, come out now. And, you know, about a minute later, these little legs come down the stairs. And it's this nine-year-old boy. And he is um, really, really little. He's, and he's this kid. 
And he's obviously sick. He's not vomiting or anything, but he's really weak. And he comes out, and he stumbles over, and there are some plastic chairs there. And he sits in the, one of the chairs. And the, the treatment unit workers start yelling at him. And you can barely hear his answers. And they're, how old are small ball? How old are you? They're speaking to him in Liberian English. And he says, nine. And they say, you being vomiting, plenty? You being vomiting? And he says, plenty. Or how many times have you been vomiting? Because I remember he says, plenty. And then they keep asking him questions and because they're trying to decide if he's a suspect case or if he actually has Ebola. And everything he's answering so far sounds like he has Ebola. And then there's the final question and the answer that is like, that's it. And that's when they ask him, how many people not die in your house? They're asking how many people, in, you know, and this is in the last week. And he said three. So he basically had lost his family. And at that point, I looked at my Pentagon <coughs> officials. And they just, it was just a really, it was right up close and personal with, this is what this is. This is what it is. This is a kid. This is a kid who's lost his entire family. Um, he's nine years old. He barely knows what's happening to him. He's sick, and none of us can go and touch him. You know, the closest, the first time anybody's going to be able to go up to him and actually pick him up is when somebody is in a full hazmat suit looking as scary as you can imagine. And it was a really, really hard thing to see. He stayed with me the whole while. There were a lot of other people that came in. Some had it, some, you know, they sent away. But I can't get him out of my mind because what's so horrible about this disease is that it makes a pariah out of the people who get it, the victims. So if you get Ebola, the first thing everybody is asking A is how did you get it? You know, what stupid thing did you do? We shouldn't go around you and touch you. And chances are, at least in a poor, you know, third world country that doesn't have a good health infrastructure, you're going to die alone. And the people who do survive will, have, will survive and come out of this and find that their entire family is gone because they're the only one in the family. Because if you've got it, chances are, you know, your brother and sister and I, so many of the survivors I talked to came out whole family gone, and it's that. And that's what's so horrible for both the family members, the people who have to watch loved ones die, and they are told that they can't touch them and can't comfort them, and the people who are dying this way. And that, all of that just seemed, that was just so, I guess what I'm trying to get to is that I came back to the States, and none of that seemed to be coming across in any of the coverage. It was like, I, I, I came back to the States and I turned on CNN, and it's like this, the, the coverage was horrifying. And for the first time in a long time, I felt really ashamed of the way we were doing it here. It was all about, you know, this case in Dallas. You know, no American has died of Ebola. We've had one person die in this country, and it was all about batting down the hatches and all of that. And I was just, I was, I was angry at the media, of which I'm a part of. Uh, and I was, I felt very, for, for quite some time, just angry at the way we were doing it here and the way we were reacting here in this country where nobody here is going to get Ebola. You, 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 you got to be, you, if you're a healthcare worker or if you're a family member taking care of an actively sick person, that's it. You're not going to get it if you're walking down the street. You're not going to get it if you're in the airport and use the bathroom after somebody. You're not going to even get it from a bowling ball, for God's sakes. So it's just sort of like, and that just seemed to be missing in our coverage here. So it's just, I don't know, I just wanted to throw that out there. It was one of the things that I, I think just going there helped me to understand. So now, you know, before I went to Liberia, I was so worried every single day about my family members, my sisters who were there and all of that. Now I know, well, the healthcare worker sister I'm still a little worried about. Um, but I know that she's doing what she needs to do to take care of herself and I know that you know, the ordinary Liberians who are taking the precautions, and they seem to have figured it out. There was a lot of denial at first. But Liberians seem to, by and large, have figured it out, you know, what they need to do to take care of themselves. So I think the numbers are now starting, I hope, maybe it's just wishful thinking on my part, but so far the numbers have started to come down a little bit in Liberia, though not in Sierra Leone and Guinea, and then so you haven't served the, fixed the problem until you can get it down in all three countries. But I just hope that at some point, the level of debate in this country can sort of evolve to where we're not doing this huge, you know, them versus us 
type of way to look at it. So that's all I'd have to say. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, like I said, I'll just ask a few questions and open it up. First question, what happened to the nine-year-old boy? He was still alive. I went back and checked on him um, the next week, and he was still alive. He was at the, still at the LWA 3 treatment center, um, uh, and I left not too long after that. But so. if he survived that long, Maybe. it's positive. It's positive. Okay, so let me ask about the, um, there was a lot of, you cover a lot about the Pentagon building these treatment mm -hmm. units, as you say, 17 treatment units or something in Liberia. How, just give us an update, how is that going since that's the American effort in Liberia mm -hmm. and are those treatment centers staffed yet, which is the big problem? Those are two really good questions. Yeah. They, they, they've been really slow. The, <clears throat> as of last week, uh, Wednesday, the first one still wasn't operational. The first one the out first of 17? The first one, which was just for healthcare workers. But it was built, it was, uh, it was, they were waiting for auxiliary buildings because there's other stuff they need to put around it. Um, so they were expecting early November this week, they expected it to be operational. And then there were four more behind that that were coming up really, really quickly. So they're saying that by the first week in, by early November, they expected to have five up and running in Sinjay, in Tubmanburg, there's another one in Monrovia, and a couple of others in Bong. Um, and then they've now backed off the 17 oh. units number and saying up to 17. If we need to, we'll build 17. But so far in the past few weeks, and this is a quieter story because I think the global response was so slow at first that everybody is too freaked out now taking their foot off the gas. In Liberia, there have been some empty beds. At Elwa 3, this treatment unit I went to, there were some empty beds in Lofa, and a few other places in Liberia, there have been empty beds. And so nobody thinks by any stretch of the imagination that this is over. But the numbers appear to be coming down so that huge, like, we got to get these centers, you know, that, that right. huge, it's, 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 a, it's lessened a little bit. Nobody knows whether this is just lull and it's coming back with a vengeance or if this is starting, we're at the point where it's starting to turn around. And unless it turns around, in Guinea and Sierra Leone, turning around in Liberia is not going to be enough because the border is so porous. So that's going to be uh, that's going to be an issue. But they're going ahead, and they they they're sort of eight or nine or are under construction or close to being finished. And I think at that point they'll assess what they need to do. On the staffing, staffing is a big issue because you know you don't have enough qualified people in Liberia or in Sierra Leone or Guinea uh, to the the USAID estimates that they need a steady chain of about a thousand people a month uh, foreign uh, healthcare workers going to these countries and so you have you know Cuba has come up with like 500 uh, China has sent some people but the that's one of the reasons why the White House I think has pushed back so hard when uh, Cuomo when New York and New Jersey did what they did because you know and I talked uh, last week to several healthcare workers who were thinking about going to Liberia, but then they hear, well, you're going to be quarantined for three weeks after that, and it's sort of like, okay, I could take a month off work to do this, but I can't take two months. Right. And so that becomes an issue as well, as well. So staffing is still sort of one of those things that they're going to have to, to figure out. And why, what, I mean, I know there's no s simple answer, but why, what are the theories about, or, uh, about why the, 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 the uh, rate of Ebola is at least why the beds are empty. By yeah. why the beds are empty. We don't. Nobody knows. There are a lot of theories. There's the. There's the. This was what when I first got there because this had started happening once I got as soon as I got there, and I remember the minister of health saying to me at one point, "There's some people who are worried that maybe people are just hiding the bodies, but that doesn't really make sense because you know because they're burning they're burning these bodies and." A lot of people in Liberia don't want bodies burned. They want to do the proper. They want to do a burial, and so they're hiding the body. But that doesn't account for people who are sick not going into the hospital. Right. So you know, it it, it could be. Uh, the hope is that there's so much on the radio. That's all people talk about in Liberia right now is Ebola. You can't you go down the street and there's these signs. Ebola is real. Do this and the three things that you know. These public education campaign says again and again and again is wash your hands, don't touch anybody, don't touch anybody sick. If somebody's sick, call this number. So I think it's sunk in. 
I think in the first few months there was a lot of denial. Um, and I would like to believe that maybe the public education campaign is working, maybe, you know, but that could be just, you know, the, the, the short answer is I don't know. I mean, I don't, right. and I think there are a lot of theories, but nobody at this point really knows, and it's too early to say that they've turned the corner. Talk about um, how this has affected the presidency of um, Ellen uh, 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 Johnson Sirleaf. I mean, it's been a big political problem. Yeah. I mean, pol I mean, obviously it's a political a big, problem. Yeah, it's yeah. been a big problem. I think this is gonna. This is uh, this is the biggest challenge she's had in her entire pre presidency. She already was suffering from second term blues, and there's already been a lot of political. There's a lot of the. Some of it is the usual second term disappointment. She's never really grappled with the corruption that's still endemic in like the Liberian government and the entire Liberian way of life. You know, so many interactions that you have with people in Liberia are just purely transactional. And there's this, always this expectation that anybody in the government is gonna be out to steal, and that's often true, is gonna be out to get what they can get. And so she's, you know, she's dismissed people for corruption, but she's never really prosecuted any, any of them, and there's a lot of anger with her about that. Um, and then her response to the epidemic was just, you know, was as slow as the WHO and the CDC and everybody else in that, you know, it came in March, they dealt with it at Firestone, it went away, and then when it came back in, in June and July, she was very close, she didn't, she didn't close the borders uh, right away because she said they're poor, it's pointless because right. uh, the borders are so porous. Uh, and she took a long time to really galvanize and really start Working. So I think that's going to show up in the negative column, you know. But I, then I also look at, uh, you look at how, this is a poor third world country, and then you look at how the United States dealt with our first Ebola case in Dallas. And it's just sort of like where we had nothing but warning. We knew this was coming. It's right. like we, this has been in the news, and it arrives in Dallas, and they send the guy home from the hospital the first time he shows up. You know, so it's sort of like it's a disease that's very easy to get away from you. I don't think her handling of Ebola is going to do her well. I don't think she's going to look very good in how she initially handed it, handled it. I think it's possible that she can turn it around, and maybe we're at that point now where you know numbers are coming down. She sat down and wrote that letter to Obama and got a huge response, right. and only she could have done that because she has the stature you know, to sit down, write a letter, and get the President of the United States to promise her 4,000 troops and send them. Sierra Leone or Guinea weren't able to get anything like that, and now you're sort of seeing the reaction in Liberia is that they're coming down Liberia, whereas in Sierra Leone and Guinea. So I think it's very much a mixed bag, but so far I haven't, you know, I wouldn't say this has been her finest moment by any stretch of the imagination. Let me ask you one, two more questions, and then I'll turn it over to the audience. So first, uh, first one of the two is, I know this is not your, you're not a, sci you don't work for the science you're section. You're ask me some medical questions? Yeah, well, you, you know the Make answer. The answer, <laughs> why, uh, you know the answer. Why have has everybody? Why have all Americans who've had Ebola survived in this country? What is the reason for it? I think it's because you get health care here, and the health care is not it's not rocket science. It's not rocket science. There, you you need fever reducing drugs. You need to stay hydrated, and there's one more, fever reducing hydrated and something else. The blood test where they test your your uh, yeah potassium right. or something like that. Yeah. Um, and they're getting that, and you're going to get that here. This is, but in poor countries, you know, it's a lot harder. Half of these places, you know, before you had only at one point when right before I arrived in Liberia, only 18% of the people in Liberia who had Ebola were getting treatment. You know, so that's right. just a ridiculous number. Whereas anybody in this country who gets it is going to be rushed to the emergency room, and provided the emergency room doesn't send you home again with antibiotics. <laughs> you will end up getting treated and you'll get intervene, you'll get an IV, you'll get, you know, and that's the difference. And I think it's like, which is why the survival rate in the U.S. right now is, what, 90 percent, whereas in Liberia it's 50 percent. Right. Um, and then it, um, in the midst of all this seriousness, I just want to have you tell the audience a bit about um, the, your family's history in Liberia, just because it's so interesting. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it, uh, we, uh, we're, we're Liberian. Uh, I was born there. My family, I had family members who were, you know, Liberia is, um, I'm sure most of you know, is founded by freed slaves and freed blacks from the United States. And my great, 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 great grandfather was on the first ship that uh, went to Liberia from New York. His name was Elijah Johnson. 
Uh, and that was on my mom's side. And on my, five, my dad's side, there were five Cooper brothers who were on a ship that sailed from Norfolk, Virginia in 1829. And, you know, these freed blacks set up the same kind of antebellum society that they had fled from in the United States, except now they were the elites and the native Liberians were, you know, made up the laborers and, the, you know, the people who actually did the work. And this whole unbalanced system continued for 150 years when it was overthrown in a coup in 1980. Uh, uh, Samuel Doe and the military uh, overthrew the government. They killed the president. They executed his cabinet, uh, which included my uncle. Uh, my mom was attacked. She was gang raped, uh, trying to protect my sister and I. And you know she traded herself for us. And shortly after that, my family ran away um, and came here to the United States. Uh, and so we've had, it took a long time for me to sort of get my head around, you know, my family's part in the whole history of, you know, Liberia and all that had happened there. And during all of this uh, time, I had an adopted sister, Eunice, who when we ran away, we ended up leaving because she chose not to come. She wanted to stay. She didn't want to leave her own mom. And over the years, as the Liberian Civil War happened, I lost touch with my sister, Eunice. And so I ended up in 2003, I was in Iraq covering the Iraq War. And I was sort of finally had this come to Jesus. What the hell am I doing here when I should be in Liberia covering the war there? And I went back to find my sister. Uh, and I found her. Uh, she's doing great now. She, I spent a lot of time with her again on this last trip, uh, except I wasn't able to touch her or hug her. Or my niece, Snipu, her daughter, who came running up to me, but it was the same day I'd been at that LA3 treatment unit. <laughs> it's like, don't even think about touching me. Um, and they're doing great, but it's been sort of a long time for me to, it took a long time for me to reconcile myself with just all of that, the history and and in a lot of ways, that all plays a part. You know, when I go back to Liberia now, this is the first time I was writing about Liberia for the New York Times as a reporter. You know, whenever I've written about Liberia before for the Times, it's been a first person type of article where I'm writing, you know, from, and I'm upfront from the beginning. You know, I'm Liberian, I'm writing this to say blah, 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 blah. But now I was writing about Liberia as a reporter. And that was a weird, it was weird for me on this trip. You know, the military stories, even the touching story, right. you know. <laughs> thinking about what do I do about the Liberian English? Should I translate it or should I just leave it? I, I thought it was just great. I just left it. And then you know what? The Times, the Times <laughs> and they let the, me do the it. The Times yeah. has these terrible rules. No, no <laughs> dialect. It has to be in the King's English or you know American English. Yeah. And but in with they, in your left, it. they yeah. left it. They, they left, left it. it. It was like they were like, wow, they're letting it was me get great. away with all sorts of stuff. It was stuff. great, yeah. <laughs> so so but it was weird for me because I keep wondering, okay, I remember one Pentagon reporter uh, saying to me before I left, she was like, Well can you write about Liberia? You know, aren't you conflicted? Isn't it a conflict of interest? And I was like, right. it's not a, I'm American and I write about America. How can it be a conflict of interest for me to write it? But then I started thinking, I was like, maybe she's right because everything, I mean, I'm sitting with these Liberian soldiers at Barclay Training Center, and yeah, which yeah. is where they killed my uncle. And I'm like talking to them and interviewing them and I'm like completely freaked out at the same time because I can see the beach right behind. And it was just very, very weird for me and 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 right. so I had to keep checking myself and okay, am I being fair? And I kept wondering, am I taking dwelling too much on the wars and too much on stuff that happened in the past instead of focusing completely on Ebola? So it was a really it was a balancing act, and I kept trying to check myself to make sure I wasn't right. letting you know stuff. And I I don't know. At some point, we'll you know somebody's going to do some horrible story that says I shouldn't be sent back to Liberia to write. Uh, I don't think so. All right, that's it for me. Who had questions? Uh, Pat. Okay. Uh, two quick things. I'm just wondering if I know you wrote a, a Pat Ellis in the front in the front of the book. Is it on? Well, I have a loud voice. Um, you wrote a bit about your re entry back into the United States. You know, you were nervous going over there. How nervous were you coming back? And how was it being under house arrest?
Um, uh, I was very nervous coming back, um, especially at Roberts Field because they took they they take your temperature before you even enter the airport grounds. You can't enter the airport property. This guy's standing outside the gate. Um, and so he took my temperature, did the chlorine check, then you go through the questionnaires, they take your temperature again, you answer the questions, another chlorine wash, and you're, and then before you get on the plane, they take it. So I've been sitting at the airport now for three and a half hours, and as the plane comes, the SN Brussels flight arrives, and you know, people get out, and so we're ready to board, and they're taking the last temperature check, and for the, like, 20 minutes before, you know, I see them coming up to take the last temperature check, and one side of my face immediately started getting hot. Right. And I was like, I never had a temperature the whole while. Like there, I stayed below. It's like that poor nurse. Yeah. And, it's all, and I'm sitting there feeling like one side of my face getting hotter and hotter. And there's a part of me that knows that it is probably psychosomatic. Um, and I mentioned this to somebody before, and they told me that by 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 what I did next, which was basically when I went up to the woman, I gave her my other side. Um, the side that felt normal, and she was like, no, turn around. She gave me, and she did it on the hot side anyway, and it was fine. It was like 35, um, which is Celsius. Apparently 38 is like scary. Um, and so I didn't, I, my temperature had actually gone down. And then I got on, and then somebody was like, well, you should never have even, you shouldn't even, you know, you should have immediately reported yourself if you felt half of your face getting hot. And I was like, if you're, you're crazy, because I was ready to get out of there. <laughs> get out of there, but it's a very, I guess it's a, but I, it, I didn't have a temperature. It was completely in my head. Um, and then the, you get to the Brussels plane, they're all suddenly look, waiting for you, and all the flight attendants are in masks and gloves. <laughs> it's just sort of like very, and at first I felt very put out, and then I was like, well, at least they're still flying here. Um, and then on the plane, there was this one flight attendant who kept his mask and gloves on the whole flight, but everybody else took, the, took them off. They just didn't touch anybody. And then we got to Brussels. In Brussels, nobody checked anything. We just walked off in Brussels, and I kept waiting, and it's like, nope. Uh, and so I had a, you know, a five-hour layover, and I, you know, uh, took a nap in the airport on the floor, and then I got on my United flight to Dulles, and um, that was completely normal. And then we landed at Dulles, and I have global entry. And so I went to the kiosk and I swiped it and it was like, eh. usually it gives you the thing, it says just go get your bag. But it was like, go to a passport agent. So I went to the agent and I said, I just came in from Liberia. And he said, ugh, go to that other guy. <laughs> and so I went to the other guy and he's like, thank you for telling me. And he immediately put on gloves and he asked me a couple of questions. And then he said, once I picked up my bag, I had to go to a special customs agent who I went to and uh, he had on. He kept, there were three people ahead of me who had been in one of the countries. And he put on a new pair of gloves with each one. And uh, finally, and then he would take their passport. And then he would take off those gloves and then put on another pair of gloves. He would do the Purell on the hand. So finally, when I got, it got up to me, I was like, let me tell you what they do in Liberia. <laughs> you put on 10 pairs of gloves on each hand and then you take one off after you've done each person. So you always have, it's a lot faster. And he was like, Thank you. And so that was it. He gave me a sheet that said, you know, check your temperature and if you feel sick. This was before they started. It was like two days before they right. started the whatever they were doing after that. Um, and then I got, I was home and I went on Meet the Press the next day because uh, they had asked me and I had told them I'm going to be, you know, I'm coming in from Liberia. Are you sure you guys want me on it? And they said they, don't, they didn't care. And so I went on Meet the Press and then after that I was like, maybe I shouldn't have done that. And I called my bosses at the Times and talked to them, and we decided that I would stay home for the rest of the 21-day period. And that was very, very hard and very boring. I went to my mom's house, because she said she didn't care if I had Ebola, that she was fine with catching Ebola, too. <laughs> and so I did go to my mom's, and it was hard uh, to be stuck at home, but it's, it was, I mean, it's, it's just, I think that was probably, I think that was probably overcautious, but it's, it was best to do it that way. I'm much more comfortable now that I'm back in the office and I can touch people and I don't have to go around saying, you know, just don't touch me for the next few days. And I hope people are not freaking out when they see me because I know I've done the quarantine. So that it takes that level of, you know, that layer of uncertainty away from it. Um, the coverage, I, I, I've already told you, you know, the coverage here I think has been the different 
policies, I think, have been, I think the, you're seeing a, sort of a, a confluence of politics. We have a midterm election coming up, and you have panic, and you have this not looking at science that's going on. I was very surprised when the military came up with their mandatory 21-day quarantine, even though they were calling it um, self-monitoring, but it's not. It's a quarantine, and they should just the fact that they won't call it a quarantine, which is clearly a quarantine, means they don't. I don't know. I don't understand why. And I talked to some people in the army about why they decided to do it, and they said that o General Odierno felt that there were so many U.S. soldiers going over there that the number was so high that if even there was one issue with them, that could spark some big you know, pull them all out or some sort of big, so it was best to just err on the side of supreme caution. The problem though is that Pentagon thing came out at the same time that the Obama administration was, you know, locking heads with New York and New Jersey and I guess Maine too now over these mandatory quarantine um, uh, requirements for healthcare workers. So, you know, you're getting a lot of, that's, you know, that's what, that comes again when people ask me again about how, for instance, the president of Liberia or Sierra Leone or Giddy has handled Ebola. Look at how the United States is handling Ebola, you know, and it's like we've only had 10 cases here. You're looking at these countries with thousands of, you know, and they're feeling their way as, as well. And we have a completely disjointed response here. It's, you know, so you're better off flying into Dulles than JFK, I guess or you know, whatever, and it's like, it, I think this certainly is, seems to be a disease that has been a challenge for public health officials. Uh, yes, they're in the uh, one, third row in the maroon jacket. Uh, no, 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 no question from Debbie Harding. <laughs> Thank you, uh, it was wonderful, your presentation. Yeah, but you. I wondered if you, um, <clears throat> If people talked at all about what, what life will be like after Ebola, that's, Debbie Hardy. That's a very good question. There's a lot of concern in Liberia that A, there's been so much, uh, the economy has been so hurt that it's gonna take a long ta time to rebuild uh, after that, this force majeure, uh, which apparently means, all Liberians know what force majeure means now. <coughs> It's like a, catast a catastrophe that allows foreign companies to pull out, and there's been a lot of that. And this is a country that's been very desperate for foreign inv investments, so that's going to be a problem. Um, but it also could possibly be an opportunity because the health infrastructure in Liberia needs, and in Sierra Leone and Guinea as well, needs so much work. And so it's possible that this could be an opportunity to, to build that back up. But um, not a, 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 that's been the biggest, when people in Liberia at least talk about life after Ebola, it's how does the, it's, it's around how do you get the economy moving again. And I've heard people talking about, you know, doing more on education and on public health and on just the basic infrastructure and that's, that's a big deal there. But, you know, I, I, I don't know how quickly that can be done. And there's not, you know, that's, 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 that's where the conversation stops. It's almost as if, sometimes I wonder if people are too afraid to think about life after Ebola. Yes, here in the second row. Um, would you say that, uh, 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 um, Ed O'Brien um, from the Street Law Program, um, would you say that uh, Liberia has gotten much, much more resources than Sierra Leone and Guinea. And why is that? Are other countries uh, helping those countries? Or is, is it Liberia's history with the United States that means we, we're giving a lot more resources? I think Liberia, yeah. I think it started off, Sierra Leone, Guinea got the most at first because they're French and MSF focused on Guinea, the Medicines on Frontiers, which they were the group most well equipped to deal with Ebola because they had done it in the Congo and they'd done it in other parts of Africa. And they really focused their response on Guinea at first. Sierra Leone was kind of limping along, Liberia was way behind. I think Ellen Johnson certainly turned that around dramatically when she appealed to Obama. And at that point, she did, she certainly used Liberia's history with the United States, uh, but I think the difference, I think now Liberia has gotten way more resources 
And I think the reason why is because of the president. I think because of who she is, I think it's because of the relationship she's built up in the United States. So she basically got the US to take, sort of take ownership of, it's not its former colony, but Liberia was colonized by freed slaves. And the United States response has been completely, no matter what they say, and they'll claim otherwise, but it's been very Liberia centric. And I think uh, because of that, it's uh, the response that Liberia is getting uh, far more now, I think, in resources than, I mean, it's getting the number of troops, it's getting 17 units built, it's getting this flow of US attention and money that the other two countries are not necessarily, Britain is not doing as much for Sierra Leone. If you look at the former colonial masters, and I don't know, Guinea seems, I don't know what's going on with Guinea. Guinea seems to be slipping back in a way that's a little bit scary. Uh, yes, this gentleman in the uh, blue shirt and tie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, thank you, Don Dickerson. Um, my, my, my wife is the USA uh, Deputy Director in Liberia, uh, and I told her that I was coming to, to see you, and we both read your book before we went to Liberia, and we loved it. It's an excellent book, and I agree, everyone should read it. Um, one of the things she said when I told her I was coming here is she said, um, tell her to get journalists to help reduce hysteria. Um, harder to get supplies and health workers. So I've been um, actually stunned and scandalized by the coverage. And uh, you've talked about it already, but um, the, the CNN all Ebola all the time and the Fox News all Ebola all the time has just been scandalous. I don't know what we can do to, to get more realistic coverage of what's happening. I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, uh, I think you're absolutely right. I think I have been I too have been appalled by a lot of the, uh, the news coverage on TV about this. Um, I think it's, I, I, you know, I think the, I'm really proud of the times at this point because I think even when the, even when the attention shifted, when Thomas Eric Duncan came to the United States and, and arrived in Dallas and you now had Ebola on, American Shores, the first diagnosed case here. The Times did a lot of stories and a lot of, there's been a lot of attention on the front pages of the Times. But even then, they were still running. Everything I was writing from Liberia, everything. We had Nori Onishi there. We had Sherry Fink there. We had, well, Sherry Fink has been doing like fantastic work from inside an Ebola treatment unit. Had Adam Nossiter in Freetown who's been doing fantastic work. And all of those stories were running on the front page too. And so, you know, I'm really happy, and this is one of those instances where I'm really proud to work for the New York Times because they're covering the stuff that's going on here, but they're also covering, and I think it's more that, you know, when you look at sort of the TV coverage here, in a lot of ways it feels as if TV just abandoned the epidemic where it's at, where it really is an epidemic and it's focusing on, you know, the three, what, what are we down to now in the US, one case? And so we're, we're one guy, and oh, and a, a nurse in Maine who doesn't want to stay in the house. Uh, so, but those are the, you know, that's what, that's what, that's the, and I, I, I guess it's about ratings. I don't, I, I mean, there are any number of reasons why, but I, I think it's appalling. I agree. What, just look, I just follow up. What do you think of the nurse in Maine? What is I it? love her. <laughs> <laughs> I totally love her. I feel like they picked the wrong woman to mess with. <laughs> Um, but that's just my opinion. I mean, I think this, you've got to look at the science. I mean, she's not a lot. I was talking, I was getting into this argument with my neighbor because they're like, I don't, she said, I don't care what you say. That woman should just stay indoors. And I was like, as long as she doesn't touch anybody and she doesn't have Ebola, you know, this is like, it's, I, I, I think she's, you know, I think she's great. But I realize many people don't agree with that. So uh, here uh, on the, uh, in, yeah, hi. <laughs> I'm Ruth McInerney. I'm a, a registered nurse. And I just wonder, you know, you said she thinks you're great. You think she's great, but you quarantined yourself. Mm -hmm. So how can she be so great when you Nobody put yourself... Nobody forced me to quarantine myself. Nobody put me in a tent upon arriving from, you know, working really hard in Sierra Leone and said, you know, sit in this tent outside based on no medical science whatsoever. So that's sort of, you know, uh, that's her, I just think that that's what the idea, 
people when, when HIV first came around in the early 80s and people thought you could get it from whatever and people behave that way but I think it's the jobs of you know our government officials to look at science and if you don't have Ebola you're not going to and if you're not actively sick you're not gonna and she of all people I think you know as a healthcare worker would know that and so I think that the idea that it's okay for politicians to quarantine somebody because they I, I think that's ridiculous uh, yes here in the in the um, black and white check. Sorry. I'm Lucy Phillips with IBI International. And um, my question is I, it's following on yours. <laughs> what, uh, and your comment about science. Have you thought about writing about who has not gotten Ebola? Because we've got to find a way to calm down this hysteria. And so that people can continue yeah. working. We have... Um... That's such a great idea of a way to do it because, you know, there would be a great story in the, the fact fiancés, that... The fiancés. You know, the, fi not the fiancés, the, right. uh, in, both in New York right. and in Texas. The fact no that airline there, passenger? Not, not a single airline not a passenger? Not a single airline passenger. It's a, it gets, it's, a, it's a really good... It's a good way to do it. That's more of... I don't know. Is that an opinion piece or is that... That's a news story, too. I think story. it's a good story. Just look, I mean, I've seen references to it in stories, the fact mm -hmm. that you know, a lot of people have. And if you look at it, you're here in the US, the pe who, has caught, who has contracted Ebola in the United States? Two healthcare workers who took care of Thomas Eric Duncan and didn't take off their, follow the, the, you know, the protocols for taking mm -hmm. off their PPEs. You know, that's all of those other people. You know, and so it's sort of like, I think that's a great way to look at it. I think that's a great, that would be a great story. I'd be delighted to provide some, some information about our team out there and, mm -hmm. and who have not gotten it. Uh, yes, here in the blue. Well, my name is Watson Harris Bruce, and I manage a project in Liberia, Economic Development Project. I'm with International Executive Service Corp. As the press, similar question that she just asked, I think we need to focus on the positive side also. Even though we know Ebola is bad, there are a lot of survivors. There are a lot of people still doing business. The economy is hurt, but I manage an economic development project. And people are still selling because people must eat, regardless of being sick. If you don't have food and nutrition, you wouldn't live. People are dying of non-Ebola-related illnesses because lack of nutrition. So I have a lot of clients. I have a huge pipeline of customers who I still, I help people get access to financing. Some of these people need to be asked, how are you managing during the Ebola crisis, still providing goods and services to clients? All we hear is the negative. I know it's bad, but let's focus on the positive also. And it would be nice to hear some happy endings it's instead of just the negative of those who are dying. We have to remember them, but remember those thousands of people have survived and are still surviving. So and I can contribute to that story because I'm actively working in Liberia. I'm Ebola. I'm not, I do not have Ebola. I've been here almost eight weeks. So I self-quarantined myself when I came but I'm still managing a staff of almost 17 people who are all helping people access credit to buy goods to help people with food, basic things. Thank you. Uh, yes, here in the front row. Marjorie Scott with the Washington, D.C. Rotary. Marjorie Scott with the Washington, D.C. Rotary. I have heard that bats are the carrier of Ebola. Are they the only animal known to be carrier of that disease? They're or do you primary. know? I, no, they're not the... I don't want to like go further than my scientific ability allows me. Bats definitely are a uh, uh, big carrier. And then bushmeat, uh, what Liberians call bushmeat, but that can be monkeys. Uh, are also believed to be carriers. So monkeys, bats, I don't know if there's anything else. I think it's basically monkeys and bats. 
Uh, so so, how, so do, far. how do you get it from a bat that needs to bite you, right? Uh, no, a bat, <laughs> no. You can eat the bat, as many people do in right. West didn't, Africa. Didn't think of that. Or you can, uh, the bigger way is that the bat eats like a mango and then leaves part of its fluid or whatever on that mango. And, that's, uh, and then you eat the mango. So a lot of people, particularly up country, eat like in Liberia, we call them plums, but we have mangoes are huge up there. And bats love mangoes, and that's a big, you know, that's that's believed to be one of the ways that it may have eventually first started. Up here in the red and uh, the stri red stripe tie. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very inspiring recount. Um, Gregory Andrews with the uh, Heritage Foundation. My question is, um, considering how hard it seems to be to catch Ebola in America and the fact that you traveled to Belgium before coming to the States, would a travel ban ultimately be ineffective? I think a travel ban would be pointless because A, um, you can't do a travel ban against Americans because the one thing I kept, you know, in Liberia when the Thomas Eric Duncan stuff started, you know, all the Americans there and there's still a lot were like, oh my God, does that mean we're not gonna get to go home? And sorry, you know, I'm American. The United States can't turn me away. So it's, unless they're gonna send us all to Guantanamo, it's um, kind of pointless uh, to even try a travel ban, not to mention the fact that there are no flights from Liberia straight to the United States anyway. You, all you'd have to do is buy two separate tickets. Um, fly to Belgium and then change and fly to London and then buy a separate ticket London to the US or something like that. Uh, and thirdly, it's not, you know, there are not that many Liberians that get visas to come to the U.S. to begin with. It's really hard. Uh, and so it's just sort of, you know, unless you have a huge number of direct flights from the affected areas to this country, a travel ban is completely, uh, completely, I think, pointless. Did you see today that, well, I had it here, that Russia said that its, its citizens shouldn't, um, what was it today? Yeah, the Russians aren't even supposed to go on vacation. They're not supposed to leave Russia. Why? Because they might catch Ebola. I what? swear to God. No, Are I there are not that here. many Russians going to Liberia for vacation. It's from the Wash Pat sent it's from the Washington Post. Um, uh, they, they, yeah, the Russians shouldn't leave home. They should go forego vacations and other travel during the winter holidays, so as not to expose themselves to infection during the global Ebola crisis. These holidays would be better spent in Russia, said Anna Popova, whatever. Um, so it's kind of nuts. It's an internal tourism. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, just passing that on. Uh, yes, um, over here. I work with an organization that's shipping supplies in there, and we also have a great concern, Brothers Brother Foundation, which we're shipping gowns and, uh, in, and, gowns and gloves and a lot of things, so we're also very interested in having medical workers there. But I wonder if there's one way that the New York Times might call them out on the op-ed page by at least these people that they're quarantining, even though the science doesn't say it needs to be done, to ask them to give grants or tax credits to the companies so that the hospitals and the people that are losing it get the chance to recoup the, the economic problem, take the economic problem away from the people that are being quarantined. I think that's a very excellent thing for you to propose to the op-ed page, <laughs> which neither me nor B. Miller are allowed to have any we, part of. We, it's a China, big wall. <laughs> they have opinions, we don't, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I have no opinions, as you can see. Um, yes, here in the blue. Uh, yes, Kay Halpern from the U.S. Government Accountability Office. I was very touched by your story about the nine-year-old boy, and I was just curious when you were describing how you were standing next to the uh, general from the Pentagon, uh, Lumpkin, I think his name was, did you happen to notice what his reaction was? He was, he was, his reaction was the same as mine. I mean, it was very, very, and we talked about it afterwards, and he said that this is, it was a very, like, immediate, because it's like, it's, it's one of those things that you, you hear about, you read about, blah, 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 blah. You're prepared as a reporter, but as a military person as well. You brace yourself and you put a shield up when you're going into a lot of situations. And that one just, he just tore apart those shields completely, just obliterated them. 
and it was very much and 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 that the, the reason why I brought him up because he, he was very I, he was very moved as well and he was very and it just makes it it just makes it so completely real I think you quoted him I'm looking from through your I stories think I, I think did. it was the he kicker was like, of the story it, yeah I'm trying like, to find the story here um because I remember you, I remember it was the end of a story we call it the kicker in our business, and um, I think it's in this story. Um, yeah, he said, uh, yeah, this is here's a story. I, how about I found it? Um, he's being interviewed, and, and two feet away, Mr. Lumpkin surveyed the scene. Hours later, he was still grappling with it. The complexity of managing and running an Ebola, Ebola treatment center, he said was not apparent to me until I saw it firsthand. And that's the end of the story. Now that from a serious he's Major really, League Pentagon yeah. general, that kind like, of a quote, you don't get those kind of yeah. quotes normally from he's, this guy. He doesn't talk, he talks, in, he normally talks in acronyms, so. Yeah, that was sort of a, there, it's a very human, heartfelt quote from a general, it, yeah. it just doesn't happen. So that was, that's what happens when you travel with these guys to, to yeah, a place like does, that. Yeah, it does, it uh, does. Yes, up here. Hi, uh, Phil Galowitz. I'm uh, I work with the Association of Healthcare Journalists, uh, the DC chapter. Do people, did you ask people in Liberia what they think of the U.S. reaction? I mean, obviously they they're, they're worried about what's going on in Liberia, but did you talk to them about you know the, the, the talks about having a travel ban and the quarantine? Did, did they have any reaction to some of the crazy talk in the United States? We didn't focus. I didn't a little bit, uh, and they were they were. Their initial reaction to Thomas Eric Duncan was, oh shit, now they're not. They're going to blame us. It was very much of, oh no, what if? What are they going to, they're going to blame us. They're going to not let Liberians come to the United States. They're going to pull out the American troops. They're going to pull all the rest of the Americans who are still here out. It was very much of, this is, this is going to blow up in our face. It was, it was that, sort of, uh, that sort of reaction. Um, I didn't talk that much about the, because while I was there, I wasn't really watching CNN and Fox and all of that. So I didn't really get into, you know, then during my three week lockdown, <laughs> I had nothing to, I had to stop. I said this to you once on the phone where I was like, I have to turn it off now. You're just like, <laughs> just turn it off. Step away from the TV. Because I was like, steam was coming out of my ears. And you're just so like, ah, we're all about to die. Because it's just, it's very, you know. But it's a No, you can go crazy watching can, CNN. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, it's like you watch, you turn, I remember one side with this is totally off. I love this story. I was watching, <laughs> I was once, I would, I don't know what I was covering. Was it the White House? Or, I think it was the White House. And I took a day off in the middle of the week for some reason. And I turned on Wolf Flitzer at four o'clock to watch the Situation Room. And it was like, oh my God, you know, maybe I should go in. The country's falling apart. <laughs> oh no, no. And I thought, well, I'll wait till they call me. You know, nobody called. And the next day, yeah. I swear to God, the Times had covered what, that story, it's like a little tiny story on the bottom of an inside yeah. page. But you know, it's just, you know, it's, it, you can get really worked up watching that stuff. So anyway, anybody, uh, one more question up, up here, or two more questions, yeah. Yes. Um, Virginie from McClarty Associates. Um, I had a couple questions. One is how many beds are there typically in a treatment center? And also you mentioned that when you arrived, about 17% were being treated. Do you know what that number is now? And if it's increased at all? Uh, it depends with treatment centers. Most of them are 100, 100 units. Some are, there are a couple that are 300, and there are some that are 50. Uh, the answer to your second question, so I think it can go all over the place. Um, answer to your second question is, I don't know what that 17 percentage point is now what I know is that last week um, the, uh, the Liberian deputy health minister said that there were 400 Ebola cases in 400 people, 400 Ebola cases in Liberia. Um, and there were many, there were some beds that were, there were still a lot of beds that were empty. But I don't know what the number is. And that number, that 17% number that I gave you was a CDC projection that came out it was a CDC estimate that came in, out in that big CDC report that said 1.4 million people by the end of the year, worst case scenario, that everybody took and just went crazy Freaked out, over. Right. Yeah, and that was in there, and that they used it, that the estimate said that was, 
And so they haven't done another one. There's not a comparable where they've gone and done something like that. And I'd be very curious myself that to see actually what a, that number comes out to. That's a good story to find that out. That would be a good story. Because I remember that was a lot of debate at the office about what we were going to do with, was it WHO numbers? That was a WHO. It was WHO, but it was a CDC projection, wasn't it? It was some insane number. But it was 1.4 million, yeah. There was a lot of debate about whether mm -hmm. it, was, it was right and what should we do with it. Yeah. And we ended up putting it on the front page. We put it on the front page, <laughs> but we, oh, I remember the Times was slightly less Hysterical. Hysterical yeah. than the post. <laughs> yeah, just right. slightly. Just a little bit, but it was No, very but we much had a up. very yeah. long debate in, in yeah. the meetings about, you know, how we should handle it. Yeah. And it was, you know, anyway. Uh, okay. Oh, God. I said two more questions. Can we, why don't you ask here? Let's have the three of you ask questions, and then Helene will answer them. Okay, so back there first. Oh, sorry. Okay, then we'll go to you. Oh. Yeah, yeah you've got the mic. I'm Renata Hall and I'm from the EU delegation. Um, I wanted to know, uh, you have traveled a bit, you have not only been to Freetown, you have also been in the border area to Sierra Leone and Guinea? I've not only, I've been only to Liberia, but I've been to the border area of Liberia and, and Sierra Leone. Is there, have you noticed any cross-border cooperation between the help services and also the authorities because apparently this is in a region where there's a lot of cross-border movements between going to the market on the other side of the border, etc. Um, I've, I've heard reports from the government of Guinea who said it's very difficult to handle the situation if we look only at, at we stop at country borders. Mm -hmm. um, how is this now being handled um, in the countries and by the countries concerned? Okay, and then we have another uh, gentleman back there. Helen, uh, my name is Alba Brupler. The, um, the comment I wanted to make is that, or maybe the appeal, is there any way that the New York Times or journalists could look at the science aspect of, of what we are hearing about the spread of Ebola? Because uh, as a scientist and an engineer, I have concerns about the spread of Ebola through bushmeat and bat and all of the other things, given, excuse me, the fact that Ebola cannot survive on ordinary surfaces for more than 25, 30 minutes. So, I mean, can you guys look at that and see if there's any efficacy in putting your story out on that? Okay, and then last question over here. Hi, I'm Teresa Casali with Global Communities. We're in Liberia doing um, community education and safe burial. And my question for you, Helene, is um, where do we go from here? In your point of view and your estimation, you know, Liberia was already struggling in its development since the war. How far of a setback is this? And what steps need to be taken to overcome the, the damage that has been done to the country um, from Ebola? Okay. Wow, I'm glad these are the last questions. Border areas, remember yeah. them? Border areas, efficacy, of, and so the science. These are three hard questions. Okay, and what to do um, from here? Border areas. Uh, the border areas are a big problem. You're never going to get rid of Ebola in one country unless you get rid of it in all three. These are really porous border areas. Uh, any idea, technically, you know, Ellen Johnson certainly shut, closed the borders, but that's ridiculous because people, like, the borders are bush. People are going back and forth across their rivers, their tributaries. There's you can't you can't close that border. I mean, it's it's impossible. I mean, look, it's like forget about Mexico and Texas closing the border between Liberia and Sierra Leone, uh, Liberia and Guinea is just not going to happen. Um, and so you have to tackle this disease in all three countries. I don't know about I don't know the answer to whether there are health officials on the borders of you know, Liberia and Guinea who are working together. I mean, when I went up there, I was with Liberian military people and they were very much, you know, just trying, they were, they're doing, they're doing on the roads and stuff, they stopped the truck drivers and the cars coming in and there's a long queue and there's a lot of traffic and that sort of thing. But as to the health, you know, people and, you know, who are actually doing, I think you have to tackle all three all three countries. I don't know how else you can you can do it. Um, to the question about the science, we have the Times has a really good health team. Uh, they're based in New York, but some of them are doctors. 
Uh, Sherry Fink, who's been in Liberia for us, has a medical degree. And so we've been doing stories on how the disease is spread and on the whole bodily fluids uh, and all of that. Those have been running from the start and they continue, they continue to run. Um, and the third question was where do we go from here? Um, I think Liberia will come out of this actually because I think Liberia has come out of far, far worse. I think Liberians are enormously resilient. I think they have shown that they can deal with the worst that people can possibly think to fling at them. And I think at the end of the day, I think Liberia will be eventually okay. I think it's a huge setback, but where do we go from here? You pick it up, pick up the pieces, and you just start all over again. Okay, Helene, thank you. Pat, thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for coming tonight.